April 12, 2007 in Uganda's capital, security forces attempted to put out riots, provoked by plans to give away Mabira Forest. Three people died, including an Indian, in a protest list with racial overtones. The march was organized by environmentalists, opposition leaders, and religious groups who harbored antipathy towards a proposal to allow the Meta Group to clear a quarter of the Mabira Forest Reserve to grow sugarcane. The 300 square kilometer expanse east of Kampala contains some of the last patches of natural forest in Uganda and serves as an important water catchment area. Government and the investor immediately backed off the plan amidst public outrage. Yet reports have emerged about illicit logging that threatens the existence of this rainforest. The sun rises at dawn as we commence a journey towards Mavira, the second largest rainforest, which occupies an expanse of 300 square kilometers on Ginger Highway. A cradle of species, it embraces gently in its arms many endangered species. The rich canopy blended by the chipping sound of birds and fragrances of nature is an allure for those who are captivated by nature. There are also rare millipedes in this forest. Yet all these are at the risk of extinction as the forest encroachers continue to destroy their natural habitat by illicit logging. It is a major cause of concern that if the destruction is not immediately halted, the forest will be extinct. Chidon is a hamlet on the outskirts of a forest which is occupied by a small community. Here, we encountered some men carrying machetes and marching towards the forest. We were told that they are part of the logging cartel who report to their puppet masters. In this area, there are settlements beyond the boundaries of the forest. This is our guide who has lived in this community. He loves bird watching and wants the forest, which serves as a habitat. It's about uh, 400 meters, then you get to the main road through the Mavira forest. We saw some people who were burning charcoal. During our trek, a canopy of trees shielded us from the punishing sun. It was not long before we found an area where locals burned charcoal. Most of the trees here have been cut to provide charcoal, a cheap porous black solid used for cooking by most households across the country. There are hardly any trees as old as the forest itself. There is hardly any new sign of charcoal burning in this place. It's because the people who deal in that illegal business relocated. Reason? To the near east, there is hardly any tree. West, south, north, all cleared. We went further to see the level of destruction. Stumps of cut trees is a scene that dots this area. If they are to burn charcoal or carry away the tree, that means this old tree and the other ones, they all must go. And that will leave almost this whole place empty or bare without trees. Looking at what happened to this one, someone was busy cutting using an axe. And this is, looks like a mahogany tree. It could be about 30 years old. But it's almost gone and you can be rest assured that they will come back and complete the job of failing it. And they're always, after like it has gone down, they always cut them in two sizes for logs that are easy to carry before they are loaded on trucks that park on the other side, especially at night and early morning. And most of those trucks always don't have number plates. Some of the meandering streams, which fed off the rich ecosystem, are gradually drying up. We are told that before the degradation, just like you can see on this other side, one tree that used to gaze at this very small river was cut, maybe about a year ago. This small river used to be as deep as almost above my west, but it's slowly disappearing. You can see it's just a few, a few inches from my feet, almost my calf.
and within a short while, we amble towards the highway. Mavira, which is supposed to be thick, you just walk like as if you're in a compound in any given home. And within no time, you are at the road. This is the highway. The big trees litter the highway, but inside lies an empty shell. We returned into the pathways that led us to the locals we found burning chuck a few meters from Najembe Trading Center, a famous spot where roast meat is served to traveling passengers. This is close to National Forestry Authority Ecosystem Office. Smoke from ambers of burning chuck filled the air towards Najembe Trading Center. Most of the mature trees have been cleared for charcoal. It's 4.20 a.m. and we are told that the people who normally ferry the charcoal after making it almost the entire day and night, they do it as early as 4 a.m. So we are going to give it a try uh, inside Mavira and we see if we could capture some of the pictures of them carrying the charcoal away. We didn't see these rocks. Unfortunately, some of these, these shrubs are itchy. This is my camera person. You must make sure that uh, you ca he can't be easily seen. Yeah, that will work. In order to disguise, we wore shrubs to fit within the pattern of lush greenery. We later covered the cameraman with shrubs and some dry leaves that looked like the environment around. We remained hiding barely 10 meters from the scene where the charcoal was being burnt. After waiting for nearly two hours, a woman dressed in the same uniform as vendors at Najembe appeared at the scene. She looked suspicious as she checked to see if the heap of logs covered with soil had burnt into charcoal. When it's ready, the logs collapse, and when one uses a stick, it can penetrate. After she left, we trekked into the deeper recesses of the rainforest. We encountered the bubbling noises of monkeys and the cracking sound of dry leaves that we walked on, which alerted the charcoal burners to take off. Because they are not sure of what might be for them, every sack they feel is hidden away from the furnace. There's one sack here. I see another sack just... Just right here. So far we've counted uh, four sacks and we're told if you're to buy one sack from inside uh, the forest it goes for 20,000 shillings and when it goes to the other center not far from Mavira forest it goes for 25,000. Later they will come and collect the charcoal since they are not hiding far from where we are. These people don't only cut trees for charcoal they also cut young trees to improvise ropes for tying their charcoal sacks. They always burn on average over around on a minimum of 10 sacks. So they do the thing illegally until otherwise when they are being found out by the rangers they can pay them some money or in payback give them if they are free each one is given a single sack of charcoal and they leave the person to continue with the activity. At night, they have piled their killings and they have lit it and cover it. It is only now when it is becoming charcoal, that's when you, you hear smell. So when you feel the smell, that's when you can move around in direction and discover that this charcoal has been burnt here. Through the sugarcane plantation, we found people carrying charcoal. <laughs> Others hid as soon as they noticed our presence. But why are these locals not apprehended? This was the response of Michael Ja, the sector manager of Ranchima from the National Forest Authority. As staffs, we are trying to do our best within our means. Because, like I said, we are monitored throughout. Sometimes, if Oja is in Najembe, people can do something to your back. It comes from this way, up here, and it's almost half of a wall of a, a good bedroom. And um, 
it could have lived for over a hundred years. But according to the people who, who come to this place, they say that those who deal in timber will take only 30 minutes to put it down. Oja revealed the type of species most sought after. For firewood, they cut pepper mulberry. But for other furnitures, they have uh, these other trees. Uh, others cut the phantomia. Phantomia are for facer boards. Then the others cut uh, Olopthea. Olopthea is the, uh, they call it Mumuri, a local name. Those are the trees people go for. As we approached the route to the forest, we met some youngsters who are carrying wood and some immature tree stems for firewood. They dashed into the forest fearing arrest. I fear the... No. Okay, sir. Do you know that it's wrong to cut trees? Do you know that it's wrong? Yes, I know. But some, someone has told me that eh? we reach here during weekend for collecting fire, the dry one. Eh? There is a dirt road used by big trucks to ferry logs from the forest. Here, we unravel huge trees which had been cut. They will soon be ferried. On our third day, we travel to Sese, Wanende village, which is less than five kilometers from the NFA offices. We commenced our journey at dawn, and by 5 a.m., the light blue sky illuminated by a full moon shines the dark and dicey path towards the forest. In this place, homesteads of people have encroached on the forest dot this area. As sunrise emerged, we found huge trees which had been felled. These are some of the oldest trees in this forest. It is such trees that drop seeds that later sprout into a forest. Cutting such trees means wiping out species. The people who deal in timber always cut the colossus trees like this one into logs of about 7, 14 and 10 feet depending on what they want for easy loading onto their trucks. What happens within this forest is that an individual willing or hoping to have a tree down who gets interested in cutting down any given tree puts the tree down or cuts it down, then involves it in with the rangers of the area. Given that station, he conducts with them, agrees on the amount he's supposed to give them. Then at the end, he pays, he's free to use the a chainsaw, or a hand so because of uh, human weaknesses I, we cannot rule it out because even me sometimes you get this information from the community and you, if they tell me so and so is involved because these communities for them they usually tell us this thing and you need to use your other tactics to see that you intervene and reduce what what is happening as we ascended to the top of the hill we discover a patch of dry savanna grassland locals say this was once a swamp Downhill, in Wanende in Sese, we found men cutting trees with an axe who allowed us to film them. The trees are a source of soft wood. There is a 51-man team from National Forest Authority, UPDF, Environmental Police, which is supposed to protect Mavira Forest. Yet with the magnitude of destruction, one could presume that they are complicit or connived in the illicit logging. Another source claimed that some men in plain clothes have guns and provide protection to the loggers. The soldiers who are brought to keep the forest, once after making their deal, take off their uniforms and put on their casual wears, such that they go with those they have sold to the trees. We have a different team who works, and uh, these teams you know, everybody has uh, his interest in the forest in love. And, uh, you know, when the, the environmental police joined, they expected to be paid the facilitation, which is not forthcoming. You know, it also sometimes demoralizes them, because this is a special assignment. The councillor of Lukasi municipality, Ruchamuzi Twalibi, who has lived near the forest, explained to NTV why such activities continue to happen. But where the, the problem comes? 
is the stomach. And this stomach is a responsibility of the central government, sincerely speaking. The central government is to come in to sensitize people and to support the community in the program, the, pro the government programs, to see that the people can earn some living. The nature and library. He has supported the two groups in poultry. One is in Najembe Center, then one is the youth group in, in Waswa. It's not the responsibility of NGOs. The government is supposed to be the one coming up with uh, programs to empower people. We are saying if there's no deliberate effort, like Operation World Creation, to conserve forest reserve, we still have enormous pressure to move. Our presence caused a lot of unease and jitters to the community and NFS staff who felt we were intruding their business. We were trailed by one of the NFS supervisors, Benson Kiplagat. We don't know whether you, you have an introduction letter from the PR. Oh. To do what? To allow your team maybe to move in the forest. And... If we went to that forest now, are there no people? The others are there. Yes, yes, if they are there. Do they all have letters from the PR? They're from the community. Why do you people allow? many people to go in that forest and deplete it. We go to the head office and then ask questions about it. Head office where? Kampala. But you're the supervisor. So that means you're failing on your job. You told me you're a supervisor. Okay, basically that's what I was, I was trying to invite from you. And... Hmm. Are you not disappointing Ugandans? Okay, fine. Fine, it's not fine. People got looked Are scared you know as I asked him tough Ugandans? questions. You see. Tell me. Huh? I asked the overall supervisor, Michael Ja, why such illegal activities are taking place. NFA's challenge is uh, the resource envelope is small. That is the biggest challenge because little is plowed in conservation. Because one is I like, in design, by design, every forest supervisor has to have a motorcycle for his mobility. So that you run there, when you get information, you run there. So you should be having even some small token to appreciate people who give you information. NFA has an ailing pickup truck and a motorcycle to patrol the forest covering almost 300 square kilometers of land. Because like if you see a station like one end, someone has to walk to Aswa and at the same time walk to the other side. So it is a, really a big challenge. Another challenge is the lot of mushrooming towns within Mavira. It is putting a lot of pressure on the forest reserve. Although they have impounded some vehicles and chainsaws, this is not enough. Trees like highly sought after mahogany are no more in the forest. This means other species are at risk of extinction. As the law enforcement officers laden with many tasks, it was revealed to us that the 20-man team of locally trained patrol personnel have not received their allowances for the last one year. Each of them is paid 100,000 shillings as a monthly stipend. People have not been motivated, you know, they have been demoralized. Because there are somebody that expects at the end of the month he gets his pay. But he works, he doesn't get the pay. So what needs to be done? We need to improve the livelihood of the communities adjacent to the forest reserve. Two is we needed to up our facilitations to the staffs, to the people we are working with, so that they are motivated. Then we also need to promptly pay part of men's wages. And we need to have some other facilitation to help people who volunteer and give us information. And we have sound vehicle, and the forest supervisors are equipped with motorcycles so their mobility is improved. We can manage this forest area. On the fourth day, we again trek to the forest at four in the morning. The visibility was poor and we hesitated to touch because we would alert the dealers who can harm us. We did not hear any sound of human activity, thus changed the road, downhill in the morning. After walking for about a kilometer, we found some people cutting trees. We tried to locate them. Yeah. 
However, they heard our footsteps and fled after cutting down a tree. Although they say that the lion is the king of the jungle, the people who deal in the timber have realized they are the masters of the jungle. This is because they detected us about 50 meters away from this place. But there, is, there are all signs that show that these people have been here and uh, working for long hours. You can see a makeshift stove where they cook from. Here there is some salt and then the saucepan and what they use to um, collect the food. And then when you come this side, that's where they cut the timber from using the hand, the hand saw. What really, really shocked me was the fact that um, our person, undercover person, managed to get a little bit closer and had the contact of these people. When he called, they asked him whether he's the one smelling a perfume. When he said no, then they concluded that the rangers were getting close to them. And that really beat my understanding how they could smell a perfume about 50 meters away from here. We were then able to have our breakfast, which also served as lunch. We endured several stumbles and falls as we continued to pursue loggers. We suspected these people could return and found a vantage position to film the activity here. I covered my camera person William Chintu with shrubs. After waiting under the punishing sun for about seven hours, the men returned hoping we had left. They carried the heavy log over the makeshift structure and picked the hand saw which they had hidden nearby. The failing started afresh as the well-built men apportioned roles to each other. They were not worried about being found by the enforcement team. As we traversed this area, we hardly saw any presence of men in uniform. As dusk blanketed the area, the men lit big kerosene lamps, which they used to overcome darkness. When it clocked to 10 p.m., we still still moved to where Chint was. My camera person had just sent to the area where the logging was taking place. After 30 minutes of moving away from the scene of the logging, we felt that we were out of harm's way. We had to do it in a way that uh, whenever they would uh, be cutting, the sound that comes from there is quite distracting to them. So that is the technique we managed to use and then uh, got our camera safe, our equipment safe. Um, the camera person was very fine and then we, uh, we managed to get out of there. Right now we struck a trail that we do not understand where exactly uh, we are, I don't know, my phone is almost blacking out. We can't even check the coordinates of the direction, but we are just trying to continue f um, hearing the sound from the other side where the vehicles are coming from and just walking um, without any sense of direction whatsoever. Tracing our footsteps, we were able to move toward the exit of the forest on footpath until we found our driver. In marches um, during the day you might not see much happening. If you go deep inside this forest, it's getting eaten up day and night. And remember, the authorities who are supposed to be protecting this forest. To the people who are in charge, if you do nothing, Mabira might soon be a history in Uganda. Sidil Yarhanga, NTV.